Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. And of course, the countdown has begun. Four days to go and we'll be into the Mubarak month of Ramadan. Um, something we're all looking forward to. And in the middle of Ramadan, of course, the countdown will begin for all the ever uh, signif significant days of Ramadan, like uh, Laylatul Qadr and then the day of Eid, the day that marks the end of the month of fasting. Alhamdulillah, we thank Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us with good health to mark this very special occasion with our loved ones. But let me give you a rundown for what's coming up your way today. We'll be looking at business and acceleration coaching by Shelley Turner. We're also going to have a guest. It will be the second time he's in studio with us. His name is Devin Munsami and he was quite a scream when he was here previously. He's going to talk about his book, all the isms and um, I'm going to leave him to do the introduction and he's going to take us on quite a ride. I don't doubt that at all. Now the 3rd of May marks the start of International Press Freedom Day all around the world. As a matter of fact in Addis Ababa they're holding this huge conference as far as Press Freedom Day is concerned and the type of awareness and the consciousness we need to have around the press in general and journalists, not forgetting editors, they all play a vital role as far as press is concerned. So in studio today we have Chris Lowe who is a SANEF council member, SANEF being the South African National Editors Forum. Let's understand what's their role as far as South African press is concerned and what do journalists, the type of protection and freedoms they expect going forward. Chris, good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning and good morning to your viewers. Thanks so much for having me. Lovely to have you here. Let's understand. We have all sorts of awareness days and lo and behold, we now have Press Freedom Day. Is it important and if so, why? Well, press freedom is fundamental for a democracy to function. So as long as we are a democracy in South Africa, we need press freedom. I think it's very important for everyone to understand that, yes, it is great to have a day for press freedom, but ultimately, um, press freedom is something that should be enjoyed right throughout the year, every single year. And the impact on, um, on, on press freedom being, um, being attacked, uh, uh, you know, I think is often not very well understood. What does it mean when the press isn't free? What does it mean for uh, someone on the street, uh, someone who owns a shop, someone who runs a business? Well, you know, uh, I, I saw a very interesting uh, a meme the other day and it said, uh, first they came for the journalist, uh, journalists and the rest we don't know about. Right. True, true. And you've hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. So, you know, very often um, it's, it's easy to criticize the media and the media have made mistakes. There have been uh, certain things that have happened in the media. But ultimately, the media are there to act as a messenger, uh, a messenger that, that gives you a message of what is happening behind the scenes where we all can't be all the time. You and I can't be all over the country true. seeing what our government's doing or not doing. Um, so we need to rely on, on, on people, individuals who, who work for organizations or are freelancers who are there to go and look at the things that affect our society and affect our daily lives and affect our, li our livelihoods in many ways. So I think it's very important to understand that, you know, I think often the um, people uh, can tend to think that journalists sort of see themselves as special mm -hmm. and they want uh, special care, special attention, special rules. I don't think that's the case. I think what, what, what is, what is um, being asked for is the protection of freedom of speech, which we are all uh, privy to because it's in our constitution, it's in our Bill of Rights. So for us to understand that freedom of the press, freedom of expression, go hand in hand with the democracy and ensure that our government is held accountable. 
Um, but it also, the freedom of the press obviously also is about uh, responsibility. You're taking on responsibility, you're telling a story or you're relaying information, but you also have to be very ethical about that as well. Absolutely. So where you will, uh, where you will be able to go and read more about this kind of thing is on the Press Council's website. So most of the media institutions in South Africa, most of the major ones, subscribe to the Press Council's um, Code of Ethics. And that means that uh, we cannot, for example, accept money to, to write a story. You can't write um, false things, etc., etc. It's very clearly laid out um, in the Code of Ethics and, and how we should be writing. So there is absolutely an immense responsibility on anyone that sees himself as a journalist, whether you are a, a credible journalist, whether you, exactly <laughs> a credible journalist, whether you are a community journalist, whether you work on TV, whether you work on radio, no matter where you work, do you work in Lanesia, do you work in Rudaput? Um, the reality is that every single journalist out there does have a huge responsibility and rightly so some people abuse that responsibility and do things and say things and write things and produce things that may not be true. But I would like to, to think that 99.9% .9 of the journalists out there do understand that responsibility and, and act accordingly. Um, so really the message is don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. You know, <laughs> uh, I would often say, um, especially in, in, in areas uh, that, that are very community driven. So, so I've been fortunate enough to work in areas like Chatsworth, which are such a strong community. People very quickly band around um, a, a topic and say, oh, but why are you only writing bad news? Well, I'm writing bad news because it's happening. You know, if I'm not writing about it, who will write about it? Who will write about a rape or a murder um, in the hope that, you know, the police also uh, sort of catch a wake up and go and be more present in those areas? Um, a lovely quote that I always love to use is um, from a guy called Finley Dunn. Um, it's about 100 years ago now he made this quote and, and he said, it's a journalist's job to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Now, to unpack that, what that means is um, the people that are sitting comfortably, mostly politicians, etc., 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 and are sort of closed off to the world. It is my job as a journalist to afflict them in some way, to make them see that this reality that they are living in is not the real reality. There is hunger, there is poverty, there is crime, there are all these things out there. And then to comfort the, uh, or to, uh, comfort the afflicted, that means to give someone a voice, someone Absolutely. who doesn't have water, who doesn't have food, who's struggling, who um, has some kind of illness. It's my job then to go and give that person a voice. And what is also very important to understand here is that that voice never speaks in isolation, right? That person has some kind of illness, there's someone else somewhere. Sure. And then it's my job as a journalist to start connecting those things. Oh, you don't have water? Well, the people in Guyani don't have water, the people in Makanda don't have water. And so you start creating these narratives around these issues. So I think that, you know, having the freedom to uh, explore whatever topic you want, is very important. Uh, you can't sort of say, well, certain topics, you know, I'm not going to look at that because it involves Ace Machashula and I don't want people coming to burn down my house or do whatever they're going to do. And, and that is the danger that you then enter into when you, when you start looking into um, a reality or a, a way of governing and a way of uh, setting rules and regulations that prohibits you from looking at specific things because there are people with vested interests. You are the... You are a council member at the South African National Editors Forum. What does that mean? And uh, obviously you were a journalist at some stage. You've now progressed and you've become an editor. Well, I should imagine, I hope it is a progression. Yes, absolutely. Um, so let's understand your role at SANEF and then let's look at the, 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 the differences or the similarities between a journalist and an editor and also the fact when a journalist... Um, you know, uh, files their story and it gets uh, changed drastically or edited uh, to the point where the journalist feels my story has been absolutely massacred. Yes. Uh, okay, so, so what does SANEF do? SANEF essentially promotes our democracy and it promotes freedom of expression. It ensures things like gender equality in the newsrooms. It embarks on studies to show that there isn't gender equality. It looks at things like the pay gap between men and women. Um, it looks at um, how our government interacts with uh, with the media. So obviously, especially around sort of um, the parliament precinct and those kinds of areas, 
Um, if there are issues between politicians and journalists, like we saw a few weeks ago with JC Duarte and some killer from uh, ENCA, then Sanaf would step in as a mediator to ensure um, that the narratives that are being uh, put out there uh, or the narratives that are happening between the two people are actually suitable and are above board and no one is saying something about uh, the other person that they shouldn't. I'm going to put you on the spot saying. here and I'm dying to hear your comment on uh, Jesse came out pretty strongly. Um, she was very, uh, she was uh, very uh, protective about her own turf and she was claiming that she's always being misquoted in the press. Mm. Your thoughts? Look, I think it's very easy to misquote people in the press. Mm -hmm. um, I think that... Uh, she felt know, attacked. Yes, she, she seemed like she felt attacked by looking at, at, at the content of that video. Um, I think that personally for me, uh, if you are a public servant, you should not be acting in that way, regardless of whatever anyone has said to you, right? Journalists are there to uh, make you feel like you're on the spot. Now, a veteran like Jesse Duarte should know that by now and should know better than to, you know, sort of air everything out there. I think the one concern uh, from the beginning was that she said, you will not ask me questions about this, this and this. You will ask me questions about this, this and this. You cannot do that. Okay, as a public servant, as a public representative, especially of the governing party, um, who, are, who are very involved in, in, in government, um, you can't tell journalists what they may or may not ask. And I think that that's where the whole thing sort of started unraveling. Um, I think it's very important to just understand, let's just be civil, right? Mm -hmm. I may disagree with you. You may some, say something that I don't like. Uh, that doesn't mean that I then have the right to attack you and go back into the past and start pulling all the skeletons out the closet and throwing them at you. I think it's very important, especially now, we are going to get emotional. It's election time. It's a very important election. Some people say it's the most important election since our election in 1994. We can understand that as we get closer and closer to that day, um, with four days to go, we can we can absolutely assume that a lot of emotions will come into this. But I, I mean, in, in any aspect of our lives, in our interpersonal relationships with people, in our marriages, it's best just to take a step back and to pause when we get so emotional and look at the, try and look at this as objectively as we can. Okay, and objectivity is the name of the game as far as journalism and editing is concerned. Absolutely. When we get back from the ad break, we're going to look at the issue around editing, editing a story and how it wounds the journalist um, and how you try and uh, express to the journalist why it's being edited in the way it has. I'm talking to Chris Lowe. He is a member, um, council member at the South African National Editors Forum. We're talking about World Press Freedom Day and we're going to talk about the life of a journalist, so don't go away. Thank you. Standing by. We're talking World Press Freedom Day with Chris Lowe. He is a council member at the South African National Editors Forum and he's been a journalist himself. The question I've put to him before the ad break is when a journalist story gets absolutely lacerated by the editor, how do you then explain or express the reason why and how is it, what do you do to make the journalist realize that he's not being attacked and he shouldn't be taking the editing personally? So I think to, to best answer your question, let's separate print and online. Uh, so within a print environment, often the editor is not only looking at the nature of the content, but also the amount of space that it takes up. So obviously within print, there's a limited amount of space because the ads need to go in. And, and then that's you, the money uh, that's that, how you get that paid. comes in, obviously. Absolutely. And then there's a space for your editorial. So if you um, get a story from a journalist and it's 600 words long, straight away, you and I both know 600 words is a lot of words. Too to long. Use in a, yes. So, so as an editor, you're going to, uh, I mean, personally, I would send it back to him and say, this is too long. Please shorten it. I need 250 words from you or 200 words. So that's the first thing. Space is a big consideration, especially uh, when you look at a headline. A headline takes up the majority of the space. And oftentimes, especially younger journalists, they'll write a really long headline because, you know, they want to make it seem as if they've put their heart and their soul into this and the headline is the best way to show everybody that. 
what the editor, the first thing they'll do is they'll cut that headline in half, if not even shorter. So I think that's a very important consideration when it comes to print. With online, you don't have the space considerations, mm -hmm. right? So um, there, from an editing perspective, you're not necessarily editing for space, mm -hmm. but you also have to remember that people have a certain amount of attention span. So again, if the 600 words, probably too long, depending on the type of content that you are writing about. You know, if you are doing a long form article on the life of Jesse Duarte, you can go for 10,000 words if you want, if you want to do an expo. Um, but most of the cutting would happen from a grammatical perspective so you know the idea that stories are sort of you know cut uh, really lacerated as you as the word that you used um, <laughs> often doesn't happen and I think that that often happens with especially with younger journalists who are new to the craft etc etc and are sensationalist yes absolutely you know they read the daily sun or they read newspapers <laughs> that are quite sensational in right. their nature and that is the pinnacle for them right that's the most uh, I guess culturally um, uh, thing that they are aware of and from a cultural perspective, right? You, they don't necessarily read the Financial Times every day. Um, so we have to be, be mindful of that. When it comes to a bruised ego, um, because I think that that's sort of the crux of your question, right? How do you deal with um, someone who feels a bit hurt by what you've just said or done uh, to their story? I would say that if, if a journalist um, is overly hurt by you as an editor cutting their story, uh, there's a red flag going up there because you as a journalist you're going to face way more opposition out in the field and if you cannot deal in your own safe space which your office should be with your editor who is supposed to be you know on your team uh, you're going to have real problems when you get out into, into doing stories and Julius Malema says to you no don't you can't do this or you can't do that and you then feel hurt uh, you know journalists are known for having a thick skin and, and, that's a, and that's a very important part of the newsroom as well, is where an editor needs to instill that idea of being thick-skinned into Think our journalists. Thick-skinned and very tough, because yes. as you've said, you're going to get the Julius Malemas of this world that's going to fob you off, yes. that will give you only part of the story, or will probably bully you yes. into writing a story uh, in a certain style or in a certain way to make them look good, whoever Absolutely. it is, whether it's a Julius Malema or whoever. So you got, you've got to be very, very tough. Yes, with, with a, lack of, uh, a lack of understanding and a, and a lack of knowledge when it comes to media and, and being a journalist, often there is room for manipulation, right? You cannot walk into a room not knowing, um, firstly, who these people are. Um, and, and that's where, if we want to just use another example, uh, Karima Brown and, and, and Julius Malema, Karima Brown sent that message mistakenly to an EFF group that said, look out for the big wigs. Now, that is the right thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, if, if I had to go to an EFF rally and not speak to any one of the leadership and only uh, to the supporters, if I had a specific angle, that's fine. But if I'm there to talk about policy, et cetera, et cetera, surely I need to go talk to the big guys because mm -hmm. they're the ones that make that policy. So... It's an editor's job to ensure that journalists understand, firstly, what, what they should be getting out of that story, and then also for the journalist to understand how, what is the EFF all about. Because if you walk into a room and you put your hand up and say, uh, Mr. Malema, um, you know, wh wh what really is at the core of the EFF? Julius Malema is going to look at you, uh, and he's probably going to silence you, either not answer your question, but then some of his supporters who are out there to try and manipulate will maybe come to you and spin you a story or two. So it's very important to understand your situation before you go into it and then after you leave it, did you get what you needed? So you need to be prepared and also I think what's crucial here is fact checking. How do journalists go about doing that? So fact checking is becoming more and more of, of um, an, actually an occupation, right? So we've seen in South Africa, we have Africa Check. Mm. They've partnered with Facebook to ensure that uh, less and less fake news or disinformation, and we'll talk about the terminology now, uh, that less and less disinformation is seen on, on Facebook. From a fact checking perspective, um, it's, it's a lot of groundwork. It's a lot of legwork that needs to go into uh, whatever you are trying to purport. Now, let's think about um, a recent story. Let's think about the floods in, um, in, in KZN. So when you want to check facts in, around something like this, it's very hard because it's happening at this present moment. Uh, and there you'll find that maybe they'll say, so the current number is 51 dead. They may tomorrow change that to 49 because they found the two people that they were missing. 
often people will say, oh, you're not checking your facts correctly. That's not an example of incorrect fact checking. That's just an example of a rolling story. And it is to be expected that those numbers will shift here, there and everywhere all over the place until maybe another week's time or two weeks time when the cleanup operation has been completed. So just to get to the terminology, because I think it will really help to understand this topic. Fake news is not something that we want to see. And when I mean we, I speak broadly for the media that we want to see people use. Fake news has become a, a phrase for politicians to use when they don't like something uh, that has been reported by a specific media house or a specific journalist. You are fake news, and we all know uh, our dear friend Donald Trump loves to do that. <laughs> and I think a lot of presidents and leadership around the world have taken their cue from him. So fake news is more often than not used by people um, to just say, well, I don't really agree with that, and I don't want to listen to your opinion. So we would rather use the phrase disinformation. Now, disinformation and misinformation, what's the difference? Misinformation would be 49 dead, 51 dead, oh, whoops, 47 dead. That's misinformation. That's, that's, but that's because of the situation. Yes, there's no malicious yes. intent mm -hmm. behind it. Whereas disinformation, there is a, a very clear intentional um, action being taken to spread falsehoods. So some examples of that that many of your viewers would have seen. Uh, China is coming to take over South Africa and are taking over Africa. Um, China's going to take over our power stations because, because we haven't paid a debt to them uh, that we owe them. Um, things like, for example, um, that you'll see more and more from a political perspective is Jacob Zuma wearing a DA t-shirt. It's completely photoshopped. Okay, um, the elections are around the corner. Yes. And in terms of elections and democracy, not only in South Africa, but globally, how crucial a role do journalists and broadsheets play? Because they need to be absolutely accurate and they need to give as much relevant information uh, during the run-up to the elections and post-elections as well. Absolutely. Uh, in order for an election to run smoothly, we need journalists. We need to ensure... Credible journalists, Absolutely. credible newspapers or cred yes. credible media houses. Yes. Now, that credibility is ensured, like I said earlier, by a subscription to the press code. Um, and if anyone is in breach of that press code or if anyone of your viewers feel that they're reading a story that they don't like, they can go to the press council's website and they can report a story to the ombud who will then make a finding. Um, in terms of the elections... We are going to ensure that there are as many feet on the ground from, from a journalist perspective so that we get a complete coverage of every nook and cranny of this entire country. All right. Uh, two minutes to wrap up, believe it or not. Threats uh, as far as journalists and safety as far as journalists are concerned in trouble spots, um, gang violence, etc., and also in war-torn regions and disaster areas. How is their safety ensured? We've heard of quite a number of journalists being killed, um, maybe deliberately or not. But what is put in place to ensure safety of journalists? Well, what we put in place, uh, firstly, is knowledge. Um, you need to understand where you're going, what you need to be doing. Um, there are, of course, courses you can go and take, you know, um, war, uh, war zone sort of training for, for journalists. Um, but I think the most important thing to understand is that there are various organizations all over the world that are working on these things day and night and are tirelessly ensuring the safety of our journalists. So SUNIF is an organization like that um, based in South Africa. We have on our website, you can go and report abuse. If you feel like someone's abusing you, if you feel like someone will abuse you, if you feel endangered, there is a reporting mechanism on the SUNIF website. And it's effective. It is very effective, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we will provide assistance immediately. So I think it's um, it, it would be prudent for every journalist out there to go and just check this out on the SUNIF website and to understand how to use it so that when anyone that, that they see or themselves are being abused, uh, whether it's verbally, physically, online, offline, wherever, that they go and report this. Because often these things go unreported. You know, we like to moan about these things, but we never formally go and report them. And I should imagine when you are in war-torn regions or any areas that might put your health and safety at risk, you would take the necessary precautions um, and you would obviously be monitored as well. I'm thinking war-torn regions, you'd probably wear bulletproof vests, helmets, etc. Yes. That being said, let's talk about how we celebrate World Press Freedom Day. What is it that we should be celebrating or accolading for that matter? 
I think there are so many things to celebrate. Um, you know, and it's somewhat ironic that we'd be celebrating these things because <laughs> these are terrible things. Yeah. But for example, Gupta leaks, Bosasa, oh, state capture. And the books that have come out of that. Exactly. All of these things would not be there if you did not have a free, a free press. Mm -hmm. Those are the things we need to be celebrating. The fact that we as South Africans, I think against so many odds, we are still one of the most free nations when it comes to freedom of expression. Um, many of our African counterparts lag drastically behind us in, in, in this regard. So we as South Africans, we, we should be proud of our media uh, institutions because they've really, really gone out of their way, especially in the last two, three, four years, to expose why we are in the position we are currently in, economically, socially, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, very quickly, um, social media, uh, are they a threat to broadsheets? I would say social media is a threat to a lot of things. Um, whether it's a threat to broadsheets, maybe indirectly a little bit, right? If you think about where people used to get news from and where they get news from today. For me, the biggest threat that social media poses to anything is the truth. Most people uh, still today, especially in South Africa, take what they see on social media at face value, which they should not be doing. Not ever. You should always be questioning what you see on social media. Is there a tool available for us to fact check anything that we pick up on social media, be it on WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc.? There isn't one, um, I would say, bespoke tool for everything, but there are a variety of tools on a variety of, of platforms that you can use. So, for example, um, there are, there's an organization in South Africa called Media Monitoring Africa. They provide a lot of online tools and I would uh, advise all of your viewers to go and check them out. You can download a browser extension, so that's something that sits at the top right of your browser. And when you go to a website, it will tell you whether it's, a, whether it's been marked as fake or whether it's a, a legitimate website. Um, Facebook have gone um, a long way to try and also quell fears around um, disinformation. So on Facebook, you'll see now there's an I icon next to every single post uh, from a, with a link. So if it's from News24, you can click on that and they'll tell you, News24 joined this long ago, etc. It'll give you details about that site. So I think it's, uh, it, the onus is very much on us as users of these platforms to also start learning and reporting these things. When we see something that doesn't make sense, isn't real, it's up to us to then report that out so that Facebook can become more and more aware um, of the problem that exists. But again, like I said earlier, it's very easy for everybody to say, oh, there's so much, there's so much fake stuff, there's so much this. Well, let's do something about it. Let's report it. Let's uh, make people know, know that there is a big problem with this. Well, thank you indeed for being with us, showing us what the life of a journalist is all about. Um, and of course, World Press Freedom Day, very important. You've just highlighted the amazing stories that have come out of South Africa, had it not been for those journalists who put their lives literally, literally their lives on, on the, the line, line. Yes. absolutely, and broken those stories, we would have been none the wiser. Absolutely. So thank you for being with us. Uh, keep up the great work. That's Absolute all I can pleasure. say. Thank you so Lovely much. Lovely to have had you in studio. Thank you. That was Chris Lowe talking to us about uh, World Press Freedom Day. And of course, that's being celebrated all around the world. And we do know that our journalists have to be protected because um, sadly, we've lost uh, some amazing journalists all around the world through whatever means maybe they were in disaster jo zones or whatever it is but um, we need to value these people they are the ones who keep us in the loop of what's going on around in our world still to come Devin Munsami about all of the isms in his new book and then we'll also be looking at life coaching
Welcome back. And we're now going to have a blast. I remember when Devin Munsami was in studio about a month, maybe a little longer ago, uh, we started out talking about the concept of happiness. And then he also mentioned he'd written a book about all the isms. And the producers thought that it might be a good idea to have him in studio, very especially since we've just celebrated Workers' Day. And Devon plays a huge role in the corporate world. He does a lot of training and he's also just written a book, as I've said, on all of the isms. So he's going to talk to us a little bit about the significance of Workers' Day. Why are we celebrating? it does it really matter is it just a public holiday we're enjoying and then the issues around the workplace and the isms in the workplace Devin morning welcome to the program Uh, thank you very much for having me again lovely to have you here we spoke about happiness the last time let's talk about racism classism sexism and all of the other isms which you've written and this is what the book cover looks like go out and get it I think you learn some valuable tricks as far as your relationships, not only in the workplace is concerned, but in your personal life as well. Mm. Workers' Day, mm. why is it important? Um, I'm just wondering why do you enjoy a holiday, a public holiday uh, called Workers' Day? Mm. I'd be much happier if my boss gave me a big fat bonus rather than a day off. Mm. Look, the work, Workers' Day, really, it, if you think about it, it's a space that we're spending most of our time within that particular segment, going there, making the effort to engage with other people. And if I'm not happy walking into if I feel a knot in my stomach as I walk into my place of employment as a worker, there's something wrong. So I'm off kilter. And then we have to have a serious look at and an evaluation in terms of what's going wrong. So your workspace has to make you feel calm, collected and look forward to going to. But the Workers' Day holiday Mm. that is being observed all around, well, was observed all around the world. Mm -hmm. The significance of that. Mm -hmm. I think it needs, we need to almost place a spotlight on a specific day in the year. Worker speaks to the economy. A worker speaks to sustainability. A worker also speaks to livelihood of their friends and their family and their other relationships. If a worker is not satisfied in what they are doing and there's no spotlight in terms of rewarding and recognizing these people, then we're saying, yeah, you work really hard, but we don't really value you. And unfortunately, if we don't value the people that are putting infrastructure in place, tarred roads, hospitals, as well as sustaining their own families, then there's something wrong. I think every day should be a worker's day, but I'm glad for now that out of 365 of them, we have one that identifies the need for these people and how important they are. All right, your book, Racism, Classism, Sexism, and all of the other isms Mm. that divide us. Um, I've just gone through the index and uh, quite blown away by by everything that you cover. Mm. Uh, For example, you're also asking the question um, in one of the chapters, why aren't there more people with disabilities in the workplace? Mm. Now, that's really very loaded and very important because we do have quite a big disabled population in the country why are they not more disabled people in the work workplace are we not accommodating them or are we just not ready to engage with them Julie if we look at uh previously disadvantaged people. We look at the face of an African woman and say she was the most disadvantaged. I'd like to challenge that. If we look at a person living with a disability, they were on many levels more disadvantaged than what the most disadvantaged person in South Africa was before. They're not significant enough opportunities. There are learnerships in place where you bring a person living with a disability to work for a year, pay them a stipend, but there's no long-term sustainability in terms of employment for that individual. Persons living with disabilities find it incredibly challenging to go and find meaningful, gainful employment and to stay employed. This is a big challenge. We should have about 2% of the population represented in the corporate sector and the government sector. It's, it, we don't reach those numbers. Some people do not have reasonable accommodation for wheelchair ramps. Some people do not, at organizations, do not make accommodation available for in receptions, as an example, or call centers. It's an underrepresented segment of the community. They are also our working population. And in fact, some we say disability, but actually they could be more abled 
in their abilities than what we think they are. They're just differently able. Exactly, absolutely. Um, how do we accommodate? How do we change that? And I know you've worked long and hard in corporate. Mm. You've got big corporate clients on your books, mm. and you go in there and you do training. Do you have a strong enough voice to be heard? Can you bring these issues to the fore, to the people that matter, for them to make a difference? You must remember, Julie, that when we speak in corporate to a platform, on Friday I'll be speaking at an organization, I don't know if I can mention them, but Go ahead. AC Nielsen, and it's probably around 200 people that we're addressing in the same area around diversity and cohesion. Now remember, speaking to 200 people about social cohesion, persons with disabilities, the touch point is so much greater. Out of those 200, they'll go home and maybe have a conversation at home with their families and maybe talk about it in their churches or their mosques, etc. So one person being communicated to in a corporate space may have an impact of maybe two or three other people around them. I think that corporate learning is very important in South Africa. Very important because it starts the conversation. It's a very, it's an area that's very important in terms of having that dialogue because it's mandated and people listen. Because I have a scorecard, I have to come to work, people are paying for my training, therefore I have to listen in the training program and go and implement what's being taught. So I think corporate is a great place to start. So for example, if we have a stadium and a conference over diversity, yeah, some people will come, some people won't. Nobody's held accountable whether they will actually come and listen to a leadership forum or a diversity session. But I like the corporate angle because we touch many more people and it resonates. Those are our future leaders. I mean, leaders in the corporate sector fuel the economy and so many different levels, they are the right ones to be able to speak to. Can you hold them to account and how do you do that? You through EE forums, employment equity forums, general structured team forums in the environment, in an organization like this, in the television industry, it, the bakery industry, we've got to regroup and we've got to talk about how cohesive are we. And if I'm not working well with you, we need to have a dialogue about why. Because ultimately, it's about the growth of revenue, the growth of market share in this organization. We need more clients. We need bigger revenue. We need people to be attracted to our business. And if you and I are not working well together, unfortunately, the customer suffers. So if we're not having those conversations about what isms divide us, we're not growing our business. You've written this book uh, through all of your years of experience in the corporate world in training. Mm. You've put the book together. How have the head honchos in all these corporates responded to the book mm. because you are really touching on real hot issues like racism in the workplace, like classism, like sexism. And there's also, you and I know it, there's a huge pay divide between the CEO, for example, and the guy on the phone mm. in the call center, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and apart from that divide, there's lots I should imagine a bit of resentment or lots of resentment. We're doing all the hard work. He takes on the big fat mm. paycheck. Yeah. Yeah, it could very well be. I've been lucky in that the people I've been engaging with in the organizations that we have been, they've been very supportive of having this dialogue, extremely supportive, more so because you have people who don't necessarily understand um, the different levels of people within an organization, different skills brackets, different salary brackets, different components in terms of allowing an organization to grow. So your skills, as you sit here as a TV presenter, you have a different skill to me, and we should be compensated at a different level. And sometimes, if you and I do not talk openly about it, what are your skills, what are your years of development, and what warrants you to earn what you earn versus what warrants me to earn what I earn, I wouldn't know about it. And until we have that conversation, a very real one, then only I'll see your perspective and point of view. These CEOs have been very supportive for the simple fact that it allows us to break barriers. Even in families, we need to have real conversations because we all are sitting there pretending. And this happens in meetings. We'll smile and we'll nod at you. But right after the meeting, I'm having a meeting about the meeting. And then I'm talking about you behind your back. And unfortunately, we don't find solutions if I'm talking in the parking lot about Julie. I find a solution if I'm talking to Julie about Julie and about the challenges I'm having right now. And that's what companies want to achieve. 
Let's go for an ad break. We'll be back in a minute or two and we'll also talk about those brown noses that make your life so horribly uncomfortable in the workplace. Mm. Devin Moodley is my guest. We're talking about his book, Racism, Classism and Sexism. He initially wrote this for the corporate world but says that anybody, very especially households and couples, should be reading this book as well. It will enhance their relationships. We're talking about the book written by Devin Munsami, who's in studio with me. And the book is called Racism, Classism and Sexism. I, I left you with a question just before the ad break. Mm -hmm. um, teacher's pet, perhaps, for use of a better word. Yes. What do you say to people like that? How do you confront them? Um, people are normally generally very nervous with these type of characters around them in the workplace. Mm. Not everybody comes with a handbook in terms of how to manage relationships upwards. So what we've been conditioned to believe is that if I tell tale, if I'm appearing to be somebody who's on your side, and I may use playground tactics, because this is the way I've been conditioned, you see. Or stroke your ego all the time. Or stroke your ego. There could be a number of different things. Maybe carry your bag, make you coffee all the time, <laughs> tell you <laughs> all the things you want to hear and maybe I'll complain about somebody else that you don't like to you. So we form a little bit of a camaraderie-ship. These instruments are not as effective in terms of long-term relationship building. And unfortunately, this is very short short-sighted. So when our vision is limited, if you and I have a robust conversation about three other people that you work with, we must know that we're sabotaging our own relationship. Why so? Because nothing stops me from taking this discussion to somebody else behind your back. It actually paints a very morbid picture about me when I'm engaging. A better okay, content so, of, uh, put, to hmm. put it simply, if 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 you if we can if we're able to discuss other people means that we're not ethical enough, we'll go out and discuss each other. You see, the, the, the gap here is by engaging in the discussion about the broader team without them being present and lamenting about how bad they are, we may bond in that moment, but it does not A, fix the problem, B, it does nothing for our communication skills to enhance it. Who I should be talking to is actually the team, the broader team, with you present in the room. How do you broach, um, you know, we know that the workplace is riddled with different personality types and you're not going to gel with everybody mm. for various reasons. How do you kind of break down those ba barriers, say to you, Devin, I don't like you because um, these are the three things about you that irritates me, but we going to have to work together. We're spending eight hours of our day with each other. Mm. Can we find a way to work forward? Is that a good approach? It's an excellent approach because remember, I was never there when you were put down. I was never there when people marginalized you. I don't know your levels of self-esteem, your anxieties. I'm not the professor of you. I mean, you've got years and years of conditioning that sit beneath the surface. I'm seeing the face, I'm seeing the outfit, but I don't know what rests deep inside who you are. What drives your self-esteem? How then am I just going to engage with you in a meaningful way if I'm only measuring you based on what I see externally? I should make the effort to get to know that you are directed by so many facets of who you are. And I think that's where EQ is extremely important. Usually, we'll fire away and judge somebody and not look at the component of the work performance, but personalize it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very wrong approach to use in any corporate environment. Because what I'm doing is I'm judging you based on superficial things rather than your ability to do the job. It has nothing to do with you on a personal level. It has everything to do with your balance scorecard. It has everything to do with you in terms of how professional you are in your current role. So whether you choose to like cats or dogs has very little to do with me. And that anxiety has come from, if you, because you're a dog person and I'm a cat person, all of a sudden I don't like you, I'll never see eye to eye with you. That's my low self-esteem I'm projecting onto you. And I find that this happens very often in the corporate space. My baggage, I tend to, to, to lament and I tend to explode onto you. And it has very little to do with you, really. So if I'm more aware, I can fix my own gaps before attacking yours. And of course, this is um, the same in a social or a family setting. Absolutely. Where we project our insecurities and... 
our discomfort on the people closest to us. Absolutely. Okay. We have a prescription of how you should behave mm -hmm. and how you should act based on what my standards are. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so you're, it's all about our term of reference and, of course, the baggage we're carrying. You also talk in the book about um, gender issues mm. and the issue around age discrimination. Mm. We do know that the workforce is getting younger and younger with each passing year. And I'm not sure where the, the, the age gap um, is accommodating each other. Mm. We're very suspicious of each other. Mm. The younger generation kind of think that you need to be put to pasture because you're way too old mm. and vice versa. The mm. older generation think that you're not experienced enough. Yeah. You need to close that gap because they both have lots to offer each other. Let's start with the stalwarts of the older generation who are forced into retirement as they turn 60 and speak to many of these individuals. They still harbor a lot of knowledge. They have so much to give back in terms of the skills they've acquired for 40 something years. They've been in the corporate South Africa. What happens is they're forced into retirement and there's no mentorship program that speaks to a pipeline of sharing your knowledge at 65, sir, with somebody who's now 25 or 28, who's just become a regional a manager. A young upstart. Correct. <laughs> a young upstart individual. Yes, you have your strengths at 28. He has his definite strengths or her definite strengths at 65. The idea is for organizations to merge this level of thinking and merge these paradigms to create something powerful and important, which is attracting growth and revenue and bringing in customers. If we neglect the 65-year-old as a mentor, then unfortunately you're, cutting, you're shooting yourself in and the foot. And you're losing valuable, uh, a very, very valuable resource and information. Exactly. There's only so much gardening one can do at 65. Yeah. I would say engage with them as a mentor. You'll be surprised how many people at 65, 70, 75 are very ready to share knowledge as a consultant for just one day in a workshop about how I did things in the 40 years I've been in service in this company. Progressive companies that we're working with are engaging with those mentors. The age of technology how are older people dealing with it? Obviously young people are taking it to like taking to it like ducks to water. Mm. Uh, but we also know that technology is growing very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. What uh, was relevant today is not going to be relevant by the end of the year. Mm. How is that a challenge in the workplace to both old and young people? It's a very significant challenge. It's not just older people that have a phobia around technology. I mean, if you fall asleep for one month, your apps would all have been updated. You'd probably not know. And your cell phone, a newer model would have come out. So technology is moving at a pace that we simply, if you want a good cake, cake recipe, don't ask your grandmother who's been baking for 100, for, for 50 years. Just ask your third, exactly. YouTube it, your 13 year old will tell you faster than they can. And she's still on sift the flour, you know, like 15 minutes later. The point is that technology is moving at such a rapid pace, not just the stalwart generation at 50, 60, 70 years old. We need to shift the mindset in terms of coping with the changing world, the younger generation too. So we all need to be subscribing to a paradigm where the world is changing. And you need to be changing with the world, Correct. otherwise you're going to die. So it's adapt or die. Adapt or die. Your favorite chapter or the favorite part of this book and why? It took me four years to write and as I've been penning each chapter, I thought, mm, that's my favorite. Then I went to the next one about classism and I thought, oh, rich versus poor people, that's my favorite. And as I continued, I'm, I feel, and somebody else has asked me this question too, Almost all of them resonate with me because it speaks to the building blocks that make my content of character who I am right now. And classism cannot be sustained without ageism. Ageism cannot be sustained without levels of, of racism. So there's all different components that make me me. And I have to start at very foundation level to ask myself crucial questions about how I see the world. And so every chapter for me is a crucial one that resonates in my life how I see you right now, how am I stereotyping and boxing you? And actually it has nothing to do with your headscarf and your outfit, but it has everything to do with how I perceive you. And to dawn to that realization, it requires a lot of internal introspection. So it's about um, kicking the judge judgments out the door, so to speak. Yes, You Julie. need to try and view people with a very, very clear lens. It has very little to do with the person sitting next to me. It has everything to do with me, even poor service delivery. You could pull out a PowerPoint presentation at pick and pay and teach the lady how to smile and greet properly. 
that is means nothing when we don't focus on how I internalized that at the moment. My EQ and my level of emotion at that at that particular moment. The more we ask the question about what's driving my behavior, the closer I get to understanding myself as the leader. And it all boils down to self-esteem issues, does it not? On a level, yes, it does. Okay. Uh, racism still very evident in the workplace and issues around sexism, which is gender issues. What are you seeing, what are you advising uh, large corporates around these two very uh, dynamic issues? About 10 years ago, when I started doing this, I was sitting in maybe one or two uh, disciplinary hearings because of a racist attacks at a work, at somebody's place of work. Last year, 2018, I sat in excess of 30. Which... But why are we still having these issues rearing its ugly head when we are now in the 21st century, we are that m much more woke, so to speak, mm. and we shouldn't even be thinking about having these type of conversations, and yet these things are happening. It is happening. I'm not experiencing it at the petrol station with a petrol attendant and another customer who's Afrikaans and another Muslim person. I'm communicating like every other South African is. So we're enjoying a very comfortable, cohesive life. But the minute we get into corporate, we see people in disciplinary hearings because you looked at me funny, or because I'm black, or because I'm Indian, because I'm Muslim, you said that. So... What's happened, we must look at in the last decade, is we're living in an age of technology and information. People like Vicky Momberg have done us no favors. People like the Greek guy on the island, for example, that becomes the most tweeted and the most shared links versus maybe a motivational quote by Gandhi or Martin Luther King, as an example. People like to sensationalize things. And what we're seeing as a result of this, with the social media and people now becoming hot on the agenda when posting and having these, these Facebook fights, is we're seeing we take it back into the work environment. I'm not saying that we imagine. Sometimes racism is blatant in your face. But other times it's imagined. Other times I'm imagining that you don't like me because I'm a dark-skinned Indian guy. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe you just don't like people who wear blue jackets. You understand what I'm saying? It's got nothing to do with that component. But then I'm lodging a grievance against you. I'll okay. go to your manager and I'll complain about you. We talk about low self-esteem. Is that driving our attitude? In a very big way. Mm -hmm. In a huge way. Because it forms the basis and the platform in, from which I communicate. It forms a basis and the platform for me to adjust the way I perceive you right now. And we can immediately tell somebody who's lacking in levels of self-confidence and who can sabotage their own delivery, their own presentation, or their own relationship. Sometimes we talk about the partner to our best friend and every other person, except talking to our partner about it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. That also leads me to my next and possibly final question for the morning, because mm. we've almost come to wrap up time. Mm. The issue around negativity. You have a lot of people who can see nothing but negativity around them. They look at the glass, it's half empty rather than half full. Mm. The weather is playing against them. Everything is wrong. The whole world is, is um, colluding against them. Yeah. The whole world is, uh, you know, there's this conspiracy against, against them and making them absolutely miserable. Mm. What is that type of a person saying to you? What do you need to get them to switch and to start counting their blessings? For 7 billion people in the world, there's 7 billion different interpretations of happiness and levels of self-esteem. So everybody has a unique set of experiences growing up and exposure, etc. I would say the switch really is something called self-talk. Waking up in the morning ah. and having a serious conversation with yourself about what my intentions are for the day. What is my intention when I'm engaging with Julie? What is my intention when I'm engaging with the petrol attendant, with my partner, with my pet, with my friend? And when we tap into the self-talk and analyze and dissect the words that sit at the pit of who I am right now, I will then be able to structure my day in a particular way. Robin Banks says that you should talk about all of these self-affirmations in the shower every morning mm. and you'll go out into the world with a very positive mindset. Mm. Do you agree with that? No, to a certain degree, yes. I don't only think it should be reserved for the morning. Although a crucial part of the day, we're not engaging with anyone in the shower, or hopefully not. <laughs> we're not engaging with people right there. We are engaging with people. But it's your self-talk. It's your self-talk, yes. Mm. But you know where the self-talk should occur? In that boardroom. 
in that moment. It should occur at in traffic when the taxi driver cuts me off. Oh. It should occur at every touch point when somebody says something to irritate me and it's testing my emotional response. That's when you need to have the self-talk. I like that. I like that yeah. very, very much. Thank you indeed. Mm -hmm. In closing, what are you going to leave our viewers with? I would like to encourage the viewers to look deep inside and to start a dialogue and a conversation that suggests that I'm here to grow, I'm here to learn, and I'm here right now to live my best life. Not half a life, not quarter life, but my best life through social cohesion. Devin Munsami, yes. wonderful talking to you. It's even better the second time around Thank with you. you. Thank you so very much. Good luck with the sales of this book. Thank you, darling. And may your journey be filled with roses all the way. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you. Devin Munsami talking to us about his book, Racism, Classism and Sexism. And of course, he also touched on the importance of Workers' Day. Don't go away. Our final interview is about coaching, mentoring and just... I think such a natural progression on the discussion with Devon. We're going to be talking to a life coach about how to be the best version of yourself. And welcome back, hot on the heels of Devin Munsami, who was here talking about his book, All the Different Isms in the Corporate World. We now have someone called Shelley Turner, and she's a business acceleration coach. Let's understand what it is, how different is it from the other coaching modalities that we've already talked about in previous programs. Shelley, morning, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you, Julie? I'm good, thank you. Lovely to have you thank here. You to be here with you. Now, coaching, mentoring, um, having a personal therapist, mm -hmm. um, etc., a personal guru, call it what you may, is huge in the States and other parts of the world. How far behind are we as far as mentoring and coaching is concerned? Julie, you know, it's a very interesting question that you ask. Um, I think from a South African perspective, we're definitely catching up. If you, if you talk to people, you know, years ago, uh, they wouldn't have known what a coach was. That was someone who took you out onto a rugby field if you were playing sport. Whereas sure. nowadays, it's actually quite a, I'd like to say, almost a trendy thing. You know, people are quite comfortable sort of saying, well, I go to a coach for X or I go to a coach for Y. Um, so we, we're definitely getting there on a par with the rest of the world. There's definitely a lot more interest from a business perspective, from an individual's perspective, you know, there's different um, forms of coaching. You you get life coaching, you get business coaching. So it's definitely starting to catch up at a rapid rate. Um, and, I, and I think it's purely because there's people are finding a lot of benefit in it. You know, you kind of need someone who hold your hand along the way when you're a little bit stuck and who helps you sort of get to the next level. And coaching is very futuristic. It's looking forward. Um, it's goals based. It's success driven. So very much in line with that. And I think a lot of people are finding a lot of benefit through, through going and finding coaches that work for them. So if I should engage with a coach, I'm wondering if I'm not going to use that person as a crutch. And for how long do I have this person in my life? Is it going to reach a point where they're going to start thinking for me and making my, or perhaps, you know, uh, molding mm. my decisions going forward? It's almost like taking power away from me. Is it about that or is it really about empowering me? Absolutely. You're spot on. Um, from a perspective of coaching is something where we want to work with you and it's not prescriptive it's about working with you to find the solutions that work for you so it's about getting you to think differently to think on a different level to set goals and work out plans and ways to actually achieve those um, it's you mentioned the word i think like a, a crutch or a, to, it, that's not the objective and, we, and and there is people who 
they sort of find it very comforting but the objective of coaching is not to sort of have someone there where they could feel like they can't move without you it's to grow them and their thinking and their capability and their their presence and their confidence and their thinking ability to the next level so that ultimately they actually don't need you after a while so it's totally different to a therapist, am I right? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. A therapist is to help you unpack all of your issues and a coach is to really get the best out of you in a business or even in a personal environment. How do you get people to that point? Do you first unpack all the stuff that's weighing them down? How does the process actually start? Very especially, I know that you're a strong advocate for women empowerment, very especially women empowerment in the business space. So how do you start or, you know, if I should approach you and say, I am a businesswoman mm -hmm. or I am in a top position in a corporate company, but I'm just not comfortable in the space that I'm in. How do you help me? There's various programs that we work through. Um, so there's either a one-on-one -on -one or we do group coaching sessions where, and you mentioned the sort of unpacking of the past. Um, I, from a coaching perspective, I love um, narrative, which is very much storytelling. Um, and everybody has a story. You have, if, if you think of a book, you've got a, a beginning, a middle and an end, and you hold the pen to writing the next chapter or releasing the next sequel. Um, so there is a little bit of a road in terms of understanding triggers, but not getting stuck there. Because at the end of the day, we, we've all got a past. And um, it's about empowering people to not let your past define you, but about letting your past be part of your journey, which empowers you to go forward and not getting stuck there, um, looking for ways of what is your story? And no two stories are alike. We all have a different story. We all have a different narrative that we, we tell ourselves or that the world tells us about ourselves or we choose to believe. And it really is about rewriting, not rewriting, but writing your own story from where you are now to where you want to get to. We don't have enough women represented in top positions in government and in corporates in South Africa. Uh, if and when they do get to those spaces, I should imagine they need a lot of coaching simply because they need to almost be on par with their male counterparts. They're always going to be looked down upon as women. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to generalize, but a lot of the men will always have this attitude that she'd never be where I am at because mm. she's a woman mm. and she knows that that is what she's up against yes. how do you help them break down that perception that they're led to believe you know when it when it comes to women and and women empowering themselves um there's no real rule book in terms of saying you can't be there uh, we, we create as, and I'm going to say we and generalizing, we create a lot of that for ourselves as women. Um, many of the ladies that I've worked with is, it's your own story that you've created. You know, nowhere along the line has anyone said, well, you can't be in government or you can't be in um, the C-suite of the corporate organizations. But as, as women, we tend to limit our beliefs in ourselves and our capabilities. And when you can get past that hurdle to say, and it's more when you do it for yourself, to say, I can get beyond that. I am able to, I am equal to. But if you can't, that's where the coach mm. comes in, someone like Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Working with the person to, to understand what their values are, because we all have unique values that we bring to, to the platform, to the playing field. And, um, and it's about seeing yourself as an equal first, and, uh, and putting yourself in that position instead of sort of backing off. And I think often that's where we, we maybe tend to go a little bit wrong because of perhaps the story the world has told us when, when in fact there's no real rules that says you can't do it. There is also a perception that women in high places have got there through very ruthless means because she knows she has very strong male counterparts. Mm. She has to work extra harder and to be extra ruthless to claim her place at the top. 
Sure. How do you feel about that? Do you think it's true? Do you think that women have to work that much harder to prove that they're as good, if not better? I think, I think generalizing, I would say yes. Um, and, and I think possibly it's not working harder, perhaps just working smarter, mm. hard. Um, and positioning yourself, I mean, it's so refreshing to see a lot more women rising up into those positions. Um, and when we, when we sort of say the word ruthless, I, I would agree that sometimes they, they maybe come across a little bit like sort of <laughs> determined and you only get to the top when you're the one that's sort of fighting that, that battle. But if we have a look around, a lot more women are collaborating nowadays instead of competing. So possibly maybe, you know, legacy sees behind us um, you 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 maybe had the general ladies of the of the corporate environment and then you had to separate yourself and nowadays you know that gap is getting so much smaller because women really are starting to collaborate and if you if you have a look at the the magic of that team coming together it's just a recipe for success let's talk more about collaboration mm. are women supporting other women in the workplace if not, why not? Is it about jealousy? Is it about someone overstepping them? And if that is happening in the workplace, how do you as a coach come in and fix that situation? Shelley Turner is in studio talking to us about business acceleration coaching. She's based in Johannesburg. She's in partners with her husband in a successful marketing company, but she's also decided that she needs to do something for the women. Thus, her baby has been born, which is obviously business acceleration coaching. Don't go away. We'll be back right after the ad break to talk some more. Welcome back, and I do have to apologize. My guest's name is Shelley Mentor. I do apologize for that, but she's been very gracious about the fact that I've been giving out the wrong name throughout the interview. Thank you for being so gracious, no and problem. welcome back to this Thank part you. of the interview. Now, you did tell me off air that you are in partnership with your husband. Uh, you've been together for a while running this su successful marketing company. How has that helped you in the space you're in now as a business acceleration coach? If, um, you, you know, a lot of people say, oh my goodness, you work with your husband. And a lot of ladies, I find that they, they sort of go, how do you do that? You know, we're quite happy to leave home in the morning. And we've worked out a really wonderful formula that works for us. We are not only life partners, but we're business partners wow. as well. And um, it, it works It works for us. Uh, in the beginning, it came with its challenges. You know, we had to learn each other's ways, trust in one another's strengths. Um, we are completely um, on different sides of the business together. So when we established that, it was sort of understanding, because we, we knew each other in life, but understanding one another in business, we had to get to know one another a little bit better along the way. Um, so we, we started out and we took this little baby brand that was a, a tiny little office, in fact, just up the road, and we expanded it nationally. Wow. Um, and we, in fact, we exploded it. We, we brought on new clients, we brought on new staff, we brought on new teams, uh, we brought on new products. And, um, you know, from an acceleration point, that is, it's a success story in its own, where you've taken one tiny little business. So th there's, from our perspective, there's, proof in the pudding, so to speak, as to what is achievable when you put the right strategies in place. So you've come from a success story, the business with your husband, it's still running yes. very, very well. It's a well-oiled machine and you've decided to diversify ever so slightly. Why have you decided to do that? You know, I got to a stage where you mentioned now the well-oiled machine it's running well um, we continuously look to innovate the brand um, whilst i'm not actively involved i am still a share, shareholder so I, I manage from a distance with it and i needed my next and something that i was doing as a uh, you might want to call it a little bit of a passion project to start with was mentoring business owners and teaching them 
things that I'd learned along the way, which I found really, really beneficial. And I saw their success starting to happen. And when I sat back and I had that sort of little, you know, you get that little worm inside you that says, oh, there's something more you could be doing. Um, and and looking at it, that, that was when we sort of said, I, I mean, our surname is mentor. Um, so sometimes I think it is written for you in, in, in your name. Wow. And um, <laughs> we, 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 we opened up Mentor Unlimited to really help business owners and and women and men in business to to take them from where they're at and give them work with them on strategies to get them to achieve their goals now i have no doubt in my mind that when you do this business mentoring um, very especially i should imagine with other women mm. because we need to be giving a hand up to our sisters um, the sisterhood can become very vicious you know, uh, simply because of pettiness, jealousies, etc. But I like to think that uh, stronger and stronger women are coming to the fore and they don't feel threatened by other women around them yes. and rather help them up than pull them down. Mm -hmm. But that being said, how much of other women have touched your life to bring you to the place where you're at now? Uh, to the point where you wanting to give back and see more and more women in successful positions. You know, Julie, I think possibly you might have just like sort of hit the hammer on the head there <laughs> in that I think it was something that from my own personal life um, I was missing along the way. So I had to feel my way around in the dark a little bit. And for me, if I'm able to, you know, I always say leaning back and pulling someone up with you, that well, well, that's the, the, the rent that we pay for our time on this earth. We, we, you know, by pulling someone up through the ranks and helping them, giving them a foot up, but not because you give it to them, but you teach them. And um, so from my perspective, I think one of the things that I missed growing up and missed in my life was not having that. And if I can be that for somebody else, it's, uh, that, that I think is a, it's a personal calling that one has. Challenges both in your husband's business jointly um, and as a business coach and mentor to you, Shelley Mentor, what would they be? I think my biggest challenge, um, and, and it's something that I have learned to overcome, um, I was terrible at timekeeping in the beginning. Um, you know, we all get 24 hours in a day. We have, a, it's like a bank account. It fills up at midnight and it doesn't matter who you are, but you get 24 hours and there's no overdrafts at the end of the day. There's no credit lines. There's no additional time that you get and, um, definitely managing my time, which is why I've actually implemented, um, a program called the success scheduler, because it's the one thing that we all find so many people say, I don't know where you find the time or how do you get the balance and I True. always say that balance is something you choose um, and and it's about using your time effectively um, understanding what the value of your time is um, you know if you if you understand what your worth is what you need to be achieving what your goals are you can work the plan backwards and so often I find we, we get a little stuck. A lot of people get stuck on that sort of going, and it's okay. I didn't get to it. It's, it's okay. okay. But you know what? Acknowledge it, identify it, and then put a plan in place to say, well, I didn't get to X today. This is how I'm going to achieve it. Because so often we get stuck as to how we get to everything, you know, sort of juggling those different hats that we wear as ladies. And, and it is possible but it's the choices that you make to make it possible. So don't be hard on yourself. Don't beat up on yourself. Learn from that setback, that challenge or that mistake. Dust yourself off and forge ahead. Absolutely. That being said, how uh, applicable or how easy is it to take all of these concepts that you teach people into your personal life? You know, I think you have to be a product of the cause. Um, so everything that I teach, I apply in my own life, um, which is why I can get so passionate about it because I can see the results. I can see that it works or I can feel when it's maybe not quite working the way it should be and then I look to adjust it. So everything that I teach, everything I mentor, everything that I coach on is actually principles that I apply for myself. And I almost become my own guinea pig, if you want to call it that, where I test things out on me to start with. And when I find that they work and there's value in that, um, 
that's when I implement them into programs because I think, well, if it can be working for me, there's got to be somebody else out there who could also benefit from it. Oftentimes, especially in the corporate world, you see these um, head honchos who have dual personalities or two personalities, the personality in the workplace and the one that, um, you know, the personality in the home. So it's two totally different people. And I'm wondering how conflicted are they as far as that is concerned and how that impacts negatively in both their worlds, their work world and in their family life. You know, when you have that dichotomy of trying to be someone in the boardroom and someone on the cricket field, um, it's when you find out who you are, when you actually come to grips with the person that you are, what's your value set, what are you about, what do you stand for, you can actually pull through your own authentic message um, and Wearing two different hats is just the same as wearing two different outfits. You can do it, but as long as you are at one with yourself in terms of understanding who you are as a person, that makes that a lot easier because they're not two completely different personalities. I mean, they have different objectives. You of know, course. Um, mom at home or mom uh, or, or lady as a wife or, or, or successful female in the boardroom, the, your objectives are different. But when you learn to understand your authentic self, you 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 will see that it's, it's your brand. It's what you stand for. And your intrinsic values yes. obviously should really reflect in both your worlds. Absolutely. We've come to the end of the show. Your parting message to young upcoming females in the business world and even the older women who've worked hard to be where they are what would it be and in terms of coaching and mentoring how important is it that they find themselves a strong mentor like Shelley Mentor? <laughs> Thank you for that Julie. Um, to all, all the ladies out there, up and coming, those that feel like they've sort of maybe got to close to the end of their careers, um, never lose, lose focus of your goals. You might want to change the plan along the way because it doesn't quite work out, but never ever lose your, your focus that's on your goals. Don't downgrade your goal to match your current reality. And the only time you should ever look down on yourself is to see how shiny your shoes are. Ooh, <laughs> love that. Okay. Um, and and, and to, to stay aligned with yourself. And in terms of finding someone that you can learn from, there's a lot of wonderful people out there that are coaches, that are mentors, that have walked the road, they've been down that path, they've journeyed that passage. Align yourself with someone, someone that you can relate to, someone you can look up to, someone that you can trust, that you can work with. And um, find yourself that, that person that is there with you along the way. I always call it your, your cheerleading squad because as coaches, we are the ones when you achieve, we, we stand on the sideline and we are normally the ones that are screaming the loudest when you actually achieve what you set out to do. And on that note, then, let's say our goodbyes. But it's been Thank absolutely you. wonderful talking to you. Um, you have such strong uh, energy and a beautifully warm personality. Thank and you. I have no doubt in my mind that people that would engage with you would get nothing but the best. And they'll truly be on their way to the top. So thank you so much. and such an honor to be here with you today, My Julie. Pleasure. Thank you. Continue touching lives in a positive way. Thank you. And that's where we leave it uh, with the lovely Shelley Mentor. She is a coach, an acceleration a business coach, talking about women empowerment. I do hope that that little discussion has made you look deep into yourself and start taking control and ownership of your situation and start empowering yourself to get the best out of what life has to offer you. On that note then, thank you indeed for being with us on the show. Till the next time, as always, take care on the roads. And it is Assalamu Alaikum and Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali. <laughs> يا هلا 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 يا هلا